I'm very pleased to be here today and to be moderating our panel on automation and um, to introduce our panelists. So closest to me here is Miko Koivinen. Miko is the business line manager, mine automation and digital solutions for Sandvik Mining and Rock Technologies in Canada. And just to note that Sandvik is our diamond sponsor for the Progressive Mine Forum this year. Um, next, to, next to Miko is Walter Sigelkow. Sigel Co, sorry, the president and founder of Hardline Solutions. Then we have Jason Cox. Jason Cox is executive vice president, mine engineering for Roscoe Postal Associates. And then we have Doug Morrison. Doug Morrison is the CEO of SEMI, the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation. And on the end, we have Daniel Lucifora, the manager of mine automation at Goldcorp. So I think we have a, a really interesting mix of perspectives here uh, from suppliers who are uh, leaders in automation to a mining company that's looking to implement that technology in the best possible way to a consultant who can speak to some of the practical considerations of uh, implementing autom automation and uh, an organization that's uh, an innovation catalyst in the industry. So I think we're gonna have a really good discussion. Um, everyone in the room here is familiar with the promise of automation. Automation has, clearly has the potential to be transformative for the mining industry, uh, but we're still pretty early in the process of adopting this technology. So just to start off, um, I'd like to ask all the panelists to give us a, a big picture view of the level of automation you're seeing currently in the industry, and how far adoption of this technology has advanced generally, and also what form it's taking at mine sites. We can start with Miko. So are we limiting this to underground automation? Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, so we've seen now in the past uh, couple of years a real growth in uh, not only in the interest on automation, but also mining companies really starting to adopt, adopt the technology. And it's, the technology has been around for uh, 14 years, we implemented the first automated loaders in Chile already in 2004. But really now the past, let's say two to three years, it's becoming not just an interest. Uh, customers believe in the technology. There's so many references around the world that it's more about uh, how you adopt it, how you implement it in your own applications rather than does the technology work. It, okay. it does. Walter? Yeah, the, um it has been around for, for many years now, and it's been experimented with, with uh, by many companies. The, the adoption now, or the acceptance of it, is, is not whether people are going to put it in, it's when can they put it in. Everybody, there's very few mining companies now that you need to go in and do a presentation and convince them to you know, do some form of automation uh, for different reasons. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it comes to a very simple uh, problem is we need to increase production safely. And one of the ways to do that specifically in any mining situation, because it is a high risk uh, um, industry, is just get the people out from underground. And it's that simple. If you can do anything uh, to get people out from underground, that's what needs to be done. I think from my perspective as a consultant, uh, maybe we see things slightly differently. Um, you know, we have the good fortune to see a really wide range of the industry where all over the world, different operators, you know, major producers, exploration companies, everything in between. And, uh, you know, apart from technology that's been around for 20 years, like, like remote scoop operation, um, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there. You know, we're just getting started. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, maybe 10% at best of operating mines that we see have some sort of automated uh, equipment beyond just that remote scoop going into the open stope. So, you know, there's a lot of potential here. I would say that the, uh, the rate of adoption of automation in our industry is embarrassing, embarrassingly bad. Uh, we continue to want to automate in order to reduce cost or reduce risk. But the real opportunity for automation in the future is to increase productive capacity. That is the only reason to bring these technologies to the fore, is to increase productive capacity. And if we don't do that, then we'll continue to 
messed around as we have for the last 20 years. We still have mines that don't have RFID tags on $2 million equipment units. 25 years after supermarkets have been tracking every single apple in the store. That's where we sit in, in the realm of automation and tracking equipment and performance. So I don't think it's a very edifying picture and I think it needs to change radically. Yeah, at Gold Corp, we, um, we operate both uh, underground and surface operations. And I'd say, as an industry as a whole, we're probably a bit more mature for automation in underground than we are uh, in surface. But we're, we're definitely, um, we've adopted a lot of underground technology and we're, we're pushing now and making inroads with automation for our surface operations as well. Um, and I'd say I agree with what the, the panel said that, you know, I think apart from safety, which is a big driver, I think um, increasing capacity of our assets is um, the reason we'd want to get into automation more. And also, um, I just think that uh, basically, um, you know, we, we, we are aware of the technology, but we're at the point where we need to create a, a business case to implement it, not just to implement technology for technology's sake, but to make sure we're going to be adding value, sustainable value to our operations. Um, where uh, you have seen um, automation being implemented, whether it's teleremote or semi uh, re semi autonomous solutions in use, um, what value um, in your experience has automation delivered to mines? Miko? Uh, so I, I refer back to the video I showed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a relatively typical result what we're seeing from uh, well, at different mine sites. So again, recapping, so Hegla was saying 30% reduction in uh, maintenance cost, uh, significantly less damage to the equipment when it's run by a robot, not by a person. Uh, Increased utilization, again, increased production, uh, safety for sure. And also want to point out again the fact that uh, finding mining people can be hard. So as the video showed, a person who had no experience in mining, his dream was to be working for a mine, uh, actually joined the mining company as an um, autonomous truck operator. And even further when we moved to having more remote uh, operation centers, so let's say we, have, we operate from Toronto, we don't even compete in the mining uh, labor market. We could hire people from Tim Hortons to run, run a system. Yeah, the, um, the interesting part is that, is that in these projects, there's always different pieces. So on, on the video from Sandvik, the, the autonomous truck has to dump somewhere. So our company does the tele-remote systems to actually run the rock breakers that the, uh, that the trucks dump on. Um, the Muscle White Mine is, they contacted us last week to get rid of, or a couple weeks ago, they want to get rid of all the old standard remote control system because the entire fleet is tele-remote now, from, and, and they're actually running some of them from the, uh, their operations uh, center in Thunder Bay now. And those are important facts because um, our company's only, so you tr Torontonians will get a kick out of this one, or you, anybody's from Vancouver, but our office is only 20 minutes outside of Sudbury. And we couldn't get programmers to drive 20 minutes to come to work, so we had to actually get an office inside Sudbury. Um, you know, the new generation of people, they want to be home with their kids. You know, so uh, somebody going to an, an operating station in Thunder Bay or in Toronto or Vancouver, you know, go home and get, go to your kid's ball game that night. That's what they want. That's what people want, and that's where, that's where it's moving to, and it has to move there. That's an interesting value add. I hadn't thought about that one. But uh, I mean, it, safety always comes up as a big one, and, and in, an, in an industry where we're very focused on safety, and I think you know, generally put a lot of thought into it and do a reasonable job, you might think that any gains there would only be incremental. But there, there are definitely situations where it can be a big leg up. You know, we're, working on some high-grade uranium projects right now. And when you start thinking about radiation exposure and that sort of thing, you know, automation has a huge leverage on that situation in the, in the safety realm. And then, you know, cost and productivity side, um, you know, we do a lot of work in, uh, in countries that, that don't have a tradition or don't have labor laws that allow 12-hour shifts. So if you're working with eight-hour shifts, your effective working time in a deep mine is so small 
that there's a huge advantage to be gained there if you can get that time you know, effectively utilized. Yeah, time is the most viable commodity of all. We talk about money, we talk about uh, mineral resources, but time is the most viable commodity that exists because you don't ever get it back. When you've lost the time to produce ore or produce value, there's no way to get that back. You can get more money back, you can get more people, you can't ever get the time back. And negative time, lost time, compounds just as quickly as interest rates do. So it gets worse and worse and harder and harder to recover from the time that you lost in not making moves to progress your operations and to generate more value. It's a myth that we're actually trying to automate in order to lay people off. Our industry faces a demographic cliff in every aspect of its operations. In terms of the replacement rates for engineers and geologists and the other scientists that we need, it's a huge cliff that's going to arrive. We need to automate in order just to have our minds have capable people to run the equipment that we have. It's not that we're going to lay people off, it's can we automate fast enough to still have experienced people left in our operations to help the new people coming in. And the new technology will radically change the demographics of our business. We don't need to worry about white-haired old guys like me choosing to, to hire women and minorities, etc. The skill sets that the technologies of the, of the future will require are completely different from the skill sets we have now. And that will mean drawing on a workforce that is radically different from the, the workforce profile that we have now. We simply will not be able to attract enough of our traditional workers, even from Tim Hortons, to come and do the things that we have done up until now. So the shift in thinking has to be a complete reversal of what we're thinking now. And for me, the biggest step of all is to move away from a technology platform that was based on human interactions and begin to design automated systems that were designed from scratch to be autonomous. If we simply aut automate the equipment that we have, we are locking in all the inefficiencies that we have built up and relied on for the last 35 years. We need to radically shift what we design and how we design it and design it as an autonomous system, not a slightly modified human intervention system just because we're losing the humans. We will need humans to do really important tasks, but they're not going to be the same humans that have done the tasks up until now. So a radical shift is coming, but only if we can free ourselves from the mental shackles that we've had for, for decades, decades, literally decades. Rio Tinto started automating 28 years ago. This is not new. In no, no other aspect of your life can you say something that we started doing 28 years ago is a novelty, is innovative, or anything else. Our rate of adoption of these kinds of technologies is nothing short of embarrassing. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think what we ultimately need to do is you know, change the process to you know, take advantage of the autonomous solutions as best we can. Um, just for the autonomous solutions we've been working with so far, which are just pieces of the process, not the whole thing, um, we believe the, the biggest potential is related to uh, increases in utilization and productivity. So we're going to see those assets um, you know, producing more um, m over more time, but also producing better over that time. So for instance, we've got an um, autonomous drill program that we're running at our, our site in Mexico, Peñasquito. And then we're also um, just embarking on it at Porcupine as well, in Ontario, here in Ontario. And um, we, we think that we can actually uplift um, the base machine from um, you know, its present status to um, 1.34 times um, that manned machine through the introduction of automation, which is you know, big, a big improvement for us. And, and it will translate to a lot of, a lot of improved productivity. And then also the, the safety element to you know, stop people from working in an unsafe environment um, more often than not. And then also, I, I think it's a big differentiator as far as recruiting um, you know, the next generation of, of operators and, and workforce. I think the jobs aren't going to go away. They're just going to change to um, probably more, more tech-centric. But um, I, I think in the end, it'll be you know, better jobs for, for the employees as well. Um. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to start with you again for the next question. Um, can you speak a little bit uh, about the limitations of the automated technology that um, you're trying out at Gold Corp sites? Sure. 
Yeah, I think presently a big limitation is that it is just um, you know pieces of the overall process. So we have to kind of recognize that and, and make sure we put it in to a position to succeed. Um, also, another big limitation is uh, interoperability. Um, you know, we're at the point now where each vendor is offering a solution, but they're not really offering um, you know a, a whole a whole mine to mill solution. So um, sometimes it's difficult to get the the pieces to to play nicely together. Um, in addition, I'd say there's there's the common logistical stuff like um, GPS coverage, um, mine site, wireless network communication becomes even more paramount. Um, so before when we were able to kind of run, and, and GPS is a good um, example actually, you were able to run previously with no GPS, then we introduced GPS, and now if you don't have GPS, often the, the shovel or the drill has to be down and you're losing production. Um, so the same is true of, of automation when we start to introduce that. Um, you know, if, if the solution's not working, that's a, that's a productivity um, you know, that we're losing for, for that time that it's, it's not working. Also, a big one is um, for a change management is the training. So you know, we, we introduced these solutions at the sites and they have great potential, but at the same time, we're counting on often the, the same number of resources to you know, support this new solution in addition to um, all the other tasks they were previously doing, which, um, which isn't really a recipe to succeed. So I think um, that's a big one. And then you know, overall change management, just make sure that the site is, is embracing the technology and you know, using it in the right way and having the right expectations so that it's in a position to, to succeed. Mm-hmm. Does anyone else want to? Well, the, the expectations of our equipment is another uh, thing that's been a huge problem for many years. Nowhere else in our lives do we expect a, a 65% utilization rate for a piece of equipment. Yeah. You, wouldn't expect, you wouldn't accept that for your car, I've and you certainly wouldn't accept it for airplanes. <laughs> you know, that's a really bad thing, 65% utilization, because it means nobody's going anywhere or going down really fast. So. That what that actually has meant for us is if we need six scoops to be operating, we need to buy nine so that we've constantly got six. Are you kidding? This is the cost of inventory in the system because the process is ineffectual. And we've locked ourselves into this way of thinking because of where we come from. And that's the fundamental shift that has to take place. It's not simply a question of automating the kinds of things we do now and get rid of the steering wheel and get rid of the seat no, go back to the fundamentals, analyze what the system requires, what are the system constraints, and design an autonomous system that will produce the levels of performance we need to have. So we don't just go for 1.3, 1.5, which is a good result for the equipment that we use. But your typical LHD will produce between 100 and 200 tons an hour. There are systems you can buy off the shelf that will move over at 400 tons an hour. And we can easily redesign those to produce 800 or 1,200 tons per hour. If you want to produce 100,000 tons a day from a block cave underground copper mine, and you do, because if you want to have enough copper to replace carbon in the economy, that's where you're going to be, how you're going to be able to do that. You can't do that with the kind of equipment that produces 1 to 200 tons an hour. That's crippling. And it cripples the whole process. And worst of all, as Rick just said earlier, it cripples our industry's credibility in the eyes of investors. And that is what's driving our business to the margins of society. That's why we can't actually hire really, really clever people, you know, smarter than me, to come and work in this business because our young people think, you guys are just crazy. Why would, it, why would anybody want to go and do that? We're not a sexy business. We are actually a very sexy business. And I've lived my whole life in this and I love it. But we need to turn this around because we can't continue to produce uh, fossil fuels the way we have and use them. The only thing you can replace fossil fuels with in our economy is metal. You have to have the energy. The energy becomes electricity. Move electricity means copper and all the other fancy specialized metals that you need to make all the fancy pieces of technology work. We heard the, co the story about cobalt today. This is true across the board. We need to make this change, and our industry has to become in the forefront of making that change, not the laggard as we currently have been for the last 20, 30 years. Maybe I'll attack this one from the other end, but uh, you know, at, at RPA, half of our business is helping mining companies develop projects and operate more efficiently, and the other half is on the lender side 
where we're talking to people investing in mining and they want certainty around risk and this is a real break on automation. Uh, you have a base case without automation where you have some certainty around the engineering and the cost estimation and you know what you're going to get and all the bankers are really happy with that. You know, that can be proven. There's comparables everywhere. We can get that. And then you say, well, you know, we're going to automate and, and we're going to be twice as good or, and it's all a little airy fairy and, you know, tell me who's doing that and you have trouble pointing to it and getting that certainty. And that's where, you know, the equipment manufacturers are leading the way developing these options and the major mining companies are leading the way making that investment, being the early adopters, trying something out because if they can prove up that benefit, they can apply it across many different mines and then the smaller fry can maybe grab onto that and go to the lenders and say, hey, you know, this is going to work. This, this is my new base case. Um, and that, I think, really is what's needed to unlock this and, and have it propagate through many more mines than, you know, just the majors. Um, unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left. We've got about five minutes. Um, so I want to move on to the next question, which is uh, what are some of the, the keys to successful implementation of, of automation at mine sites? Um, maybe, Walter, you could start. It's the uh, buy-in at every level. The, the top people in the mine, you know, sit at meetings like this and they listen to the talk about automation and they say, we have to put this in our mind. But if the people at the mine site, right down to the the janitor who cleans the room that you put the station in is not, doesn't buy into it, you're not going to have success. The, uh, now because of you know, automation in general in the mining industry, it takes in your communication systems, your machines, your uh, you know, hydraulics, uh, electronics, everything else. The breed of people required to maintain these systems does not exist. So, Training these people and training from the ground up is, is a very important uh, part that we have to do. And that's one of the things that's difficult today in, in uh, implementing uh, these new systems into the mines. Then you run into another problem that a lot of the mines are very remote. So when you get a guy trained right up, he works for a mining company and he happens to fly out to Timbuktu for two weeks in, two weeks out. You train him on a very high skilled level and next thing you know he's no longer working for that mining company, he's moved on to something closer to the home. So you no sooner get somebody trained and you, gotta, you just got to have an ongoing uh, training program. That, that is one of the biggest um, hurdles that we're running into today, both on, on, from the, the vendor side and from the mining side. So. Miko, do you want to speak to some of the keys to successful implementation? Yeah, just adding, adding to the previous. So where I've seen some projects fail is uh, it's really how it's structured, very project focused, uh, very successful project implementation, the project team focusing on technology, everybody's focused only on the, on the project, but once the project is handed over to the operations who has not been part of the project, it starts to fail. So it goes from resulted up here, suddenly now, let me get a call what happened. Uh, Luckily, not ha that doesn't happen all the time, but it, it, it does happen. Mm -hmm. So again, it's part of the change management approach. And maybe just to wrap up, um, do you have any advice for companies who have been either skeptical about automation or are unsure how to start? Start, start with Mika. So technology works, it's available. Uh, think big. If you have your doubts, start small, step-by-step -step approach, but you can take the steps pretty fast once you've taken the first step. Yeah, there's, there's, there's many ways to enter the, uh, the automation. And, and we're talking a lot about the mobile equipment and the mines and the moving equipment, but there's many other parts that, uh, that can be automated through the process. There's, uh, you know, so we have mines with locomotives. Uh, you know, this kind of loose term of automation compared to teleoperation, but you know, you, with uh, an automated piece of equipment, you still have to get the ore from wherever it dumps to surface. You need to get it broken across a, a grizzly. There's so many other pieces of the puzzle. And, uh, you know, companies just, I think the vendors and, and companies kind of got to work together a little better to uh, kind, of, kind of do their part really well and, and get the systems working well. In his talk uh, earlier, Sean mentioned uh, the level of cooperation across companies in the industry. And I think that's a huge strength. Um, and, uh, you know, I can personally attest that uh, Agnico walks the walk there. I, you know, we've 
brought someone to, to see the rail there at Goldex and uh, had a very honest discussion about what's working and what's not and, uh, and how it, it might be better applied in the next round. And, and that's a huge advantage. Anyone considering this should, should grab onto that cooperation and reach out to someone who's doing something similar. For anybody who has even one scintilla of doubt of the value of automation of equipment, dismiss that, start now. You're already way behind the eight ball and you need to get moving forward faster. And the faster you move forward, the more productivity you will gain. And eventually you'll flip over to what I might call my side, the dark side, which is to design autonomous systems from scratch to make your productivity sing. And that's what we have to do. Fix infrastructure where we are. It's, it would be nice if we could find minerals all over the place, conveniently located to an urban center near you, but that's not true. We have to produce the minerals where we find them, and it has to become autonomous with minimal human intervention at site. Daniel, you get the last word. All right, yeah, so I, I would say that the biggest thing for me is make an informed decision. So um, understand what your needs and requirements are um, at your site, in your operations, at your overall company, um, you know. And also understand clearly what um, the systems you're considering can deliver. Um, you know, understand what their limitations and the requirements from, from you to maintain them are. And then if there's a fit, then by all means, you know, move forward with automation. Let Alicia, let's just take one from Slido over here instead of opening up to the crowd because people have been actively participating, which is great. I think the top question is, is a good one. I'll read it out. Um, I'm only going to ask one person to respond, though, so whoever wants to raise your hand because we're short on time, so we just have time for one response. A company is proposing automation for your operation. What's the first factor you look for to decide not to proceed with that automation? I mean, Doug, you're going to say there's no reason. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. The fact is, your mine is getting deeper every single day. You're mining a fixed asset. As you go deeper, your costs go up. If you're not changing your production process to be cheaper and faster, you're eroding your return on investment every single day. Keeping your process the same in a deepening mine means eroding your return on investment. This is not a risk, by the way. This is an absolute guarantee. So the risk that you think of is our perception of risk that's mistaken. In our business, in a deepening operation with a fixed asset, depleting a fixed asset, risk is doing the same thing day after day after day. That's the risk. In fact, it's not a risk. It's a guarantee of poorer performance. If you're not innovating and improving your performance, you're losing ground every single day. And that's why you should start yesterday. Just to answer the question, it's, it's, it's very simple. If an automation project is presented and it has no payback, your shareholders are going to fire you. <laughs> so that, that's what it has to be. There has to be a reason to put automation in, and it has to be financial. You know, uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and if it's based purely on safety, it, it may do it. It may work for a little while, but it's not going to be... It won't keep going. If it's profitable, if it puts more, uh, you know, more muck at the end of the, up on surface at the end of the day, the shareholders are happy, and then they'll invest in the next project. So even as a, even as a supplier, I always look. I want to know where the payback is, and if there's no payback, it's going to fail. Excellent. Walter, the last word is yours. Thank That's you, it. Everyone. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>